I'm pleased to be here uh, at Blackberry office and with Matthias Eriksson, whom I have known for some few years. And now he's at Blackberry heading Blackberry IoT business mm -hmm. and uh, definitely would like to know more about his role, your role, mm -hmm. uh, and what you do and what you're covering right now. And, uh, and then we can deep dive into further questions. Sure. Great. Well, first of all, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, so I had up uh, one of the two divisions within BlackBerry. Uh, BlackBerry uh, is now a software company. I've been a software company for, for many years. There are two divisions within BlackBerry. Uh, one is called cybersecurity. And the other one is called IoT, which is not necessarily the greatest uh, name you could give to a division because it can, means, uh, it can mean more or less anything. You know? All right. uh, the cybersecurity business is an enterprise software business and you know, laptops, uh, devices of various kinds, uh, protection, very different from what we do in the IoT world. The IoT business is essentially about what we call foundational software. Mm. Uh, essentially, we uh, provide foundational software for B2B edge devices. Think advanced compute at the edge, mm -hmm. uh, cars, robots, uh, industrial automation, PLCs. Mm -hmm. um, and the core proposition is performance, safety, security, and reliability for the foundational stack. Mm. That's great. Uh, can you give me color on, like everyone knows BlackBerry uh, on that smartphone yeah. era, right? They still have that image and with yeah. the new BlackBerry movie coming, uh, and everyone has watched it, I guess. Uh, still, there is that image, mm -hmm. but I think BlackBerry has pivoted really well in the last 10 years uh, into becoming a software powerhouse. And as you said, uh, especially in embedded and automotive space, mm -hmm. right? So can you explain uh, how you have seen the transition uh, over the last decade? Yeah, so, so the transition happened uh, quite some time back. So, yeah. uh, you know, you rewind the the clock a uh, decade or so. Uh, in 2013, um, John Chen took over as the CEO, saving essentially uh, <laughs> BlackBerry from bankruptcy Bankrupt. at that point in time. Yeah. So you had that very rapidly declining uh, handset business. And you know, after sort of stopping the bleeding and, uh, and deciding on what to do next, uh, John Chen put the, the company on a path to uh, becoming a software company, and his his focus was uh, essentially to build a cybersecurity business. Mm -hmm. You know, BlackBerry was famous not just for the QWERTY keyboard, but also for uh, having the highest possible security associated Correct. with the various applications. Also, the messaging, you know, famously used by governments yeah. uh, across the world, had to tear them out of uh, the hands of the White <laughs> House and, uh, and so <laughs> forth. Uh, but that, that piece of the IP, that, that mm. software capability, uh, was retained by John Chen and the new management team when he took over. And he, he started building, through a, a string of acquisitions, a cybersecurity business. All right. um, there were a couple of other areas that BlackBerry had acquired capabilities uh, in uh, uh, over time. Mm -hmm. um, Certicom was a business uh, that BlackBerry bought to incorporate, for example, the ECC patents, all mm -hmm. the global ECC patents, uh, to incorporate them into the security portfolio. Um, there were bits and pieces that were also sort of peripherally related to, uh, to the future cybersecurity business. And then um, uh, they acquired QNX. Uh, yes. and, and QNX uh, has been around for, for an extended period of time, uh, you know, 40 years or so. Real-time operating system, always focused on, uh, on safety and security from the beginning. Um, but that was never the focus of mm. John Chen's strategy. So John mm. Chen focused on building the, the cybersecurity business. And then uh, I joined the company uh, almost three years ago now uh, when John had decided that he was going to uh, reorganize and split the company into two pieces. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a cybersecurity business, you're going to have an, uh, an IoT okay. business. And QNX uh, became the core of what we today call BlackBerry IoT. So uh, it's a software business, edge compute, uh, embedded software, and yeah. uh, very different from sort of the enterprise cybersecurity uh, portion that we have on the other side. Great. So talking about software, and there's a famous quote from Mark Anderson, software is eating the world, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, obviously, we are at the cusp of where software and AI 
will intersect, right? Mm -hmm. And is intersecting right now mm -hmm. with Gen AI. So how do you see uh, this evolution of software define everything mm -hmm. where BlackBerry is a key component or key player? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are obviously many components uh, to that question. So, you know, if, if software is eating the world, um, I, I would argue that what we are trying to do is to help customers that develop software eat the world. We, we are a component <laughs> of other, uh, other uh, ecosystem players' end-to-end -end solutions. We do not provide end-to-end -end solutions. Uh, and it, it's important to point out because QNX originally had mm. an end-to-end -end solution mm. dimension. Uh, um, several years ago, uh, in particular, starting with the automotive industry, where QNX traditionally had an integrated IBI system, you know, all the way from the chipset all the way up to the HMI and, mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. Uh, many years ago, the team, way before my time, realized that, that that IBI business, which today sort of bundles together with other things into the digital cockpit, was going to go away. Uh, that's a, a business that a typical OEM wants to have more control over, they right. want to manage the consumer interface, they want to, you know, have a strong relationship with the customers and be able to customize that and so forth. And then you had a large open source movement and you had some of the hyperscalers like Google coming in with Android and so forth. So the team many years ago decided to pivot the business from building integrated stacks mm -hmm. to what we today call foundational software. Okay. Essentially provide the plumbing Hmm. of advanced edge compute, uh, hardware software separation, you know, drivers, uh, certain middleware components that hmm. are not necessarily differentiating uh, from, from a consumer perspective, right. but they just have to work. Correct. You have to have the highest performance, you have to have them uh, safe and secure by right. design, you have to have high reliability, and, and that's at the heart of the proposition of, of what we provide to this day. So we, we help others that develop software that eats the world. Uh, right. we, we see ourselves as, you know, AWS has this great phrase where they talk about undifferentiated heavy lifting. Uh, if you are <laughs> trying to build an end-to-end -end solution, don't spend all your, va your valuable software engineers on what everybody else as also as needs. Right. Spend yeah. them higher up in the stack, focused on, on what is differentiating in the consumer experience. And, and we take care of that, you know, some people would argue boring stuff at the bottom of the stack. <laughs> we would argue it's our core business. And that's, that's what we do. It's foundational to, like as you said, uh, like for software defined everything, you need a very strong foundation with respect to safety, security. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is becoming very important in embedded world, as well as in automotive, as yes. you'll see so much data coming off from the car. Yes, right? yes. Uh, yes, yeah, so th that was the, the second portion of, of your question. And so uh, if I look at sort of data aspect of edge compute, if, you know, the last 10 years have been uh, essentially about the cloud and how the cloud has evolved and, and so forth, you know, today's advanced edge compute devices, they generate so much data. Uh, you take the, the modern car as an example, you simply cannot take that data and move all of that data to the cloud. So Correct. stepwise, you know, as the compute architecture evolves, more and more data processing needs to happen close to mm. the edge, near, you know, the origin of, of the data. And then you, you pull, you know, the select pieces that you need, ideally dynamically, mm. so you don't have to predefine it, but, you know, you pull what you need from the edge and you, you do uh, sort of the valuable process in the cloud, but not, not all of it. And, and that's partly where we come in. We have... On that particular topic for automotive, we have a, a joint R&D with AWS mm. uh, called Ivy, uh, mm. which is essentially about the data explosion at the edge, right. uh, allowing uh, OEMs to dynamically deploy ML models from cloud to edge, mm -hmm. uh, extract the insights, not all the data, and send it back for mm -hmm. processing as opposed to, to bringing all the data back to the cloud. So again, we are an enabler. Uh, we, we try to take care of some of the, the, the foundational stuff so right. they can focus on, on the value add. Brilliant. So, uh, since you talked about AWS, I think mm. partnerships becomes very important. Yes. In this, it, because it's essentially an ecosystem play. Yes. Right? So, any other partnerships you would highlight or even elaborate more on AWS partnership that would help us out yes. understand? Yes. So, so that is absolutely crucial for, uh, for, for our business. So, uh, again, we are extremely fortunate uh, to work uh, both across multiple industries, mm. obviously on a global basis, 
but then also across the value chain. So we are, a, we are a, in the ecosystem that we serve, we're a small player. We are a very, very focused software R&D play for the foundational uh, portion of the stack. But because we are specialists in something that others might not want to be specialists <laughs> in, uh, we work with everybody. We work right. with the leading SOC vendors. Uh, we work with uh, you know the leading cloud vendors. Uh, AWS is a great example. We work with uh, you know all the tier ones in the automotive ecosystem, all the OEMs, all the system integrators, um, and essentially uh, we help whoever it is that is trying to orchestrate mm. and build a full end-to-end -end solution make that work faster, better, and cheaper. I, we, we try to take some of the boring stuff out of the uh, the building of the stack. That'd be great. And uh, beyond automotive, when we look at the overall IoT market, uh, which are the key verticals you see are ripe for disruption? Yes, yeah, so uh, ripe, I'm not sure I would use ripe for disruption, but what I, what I would say is the following. So um, the way we think about the various segments we serve is you have this, this combination of of three very, very important structural trends. Mm. Um, and uh, they are a little bit uh, simplistic, but I, I think they are important, so I'll, I'll recap them anyway. So essentially our business across any segment is driven by three, uh, three core trends. So the first, the first one is, you know, for the last five years, and I would argue for the next 10, 15, 20 years, whatever you said, there is this exponential growth in B2B edge devices. Mm. So first of all, we, we serve only B2B edge. We don't do consumer be, IoT, and that's right. part of the problem with this IoT name. But uh, B2B edge devices, there's just more and more of them being deployed uh, mm. across multiple different segments. So the second thing that is happening is that each one of these devices is becoming smarter uh, sure. on the hardware side. So more compute, more memory, more, more connectivity, sensors, more sensors, yeah. whatever. It, it just, it's just becoming smarter. And as they become smarter or more capable on the hardware side, almost by definition, they require a modern, layered, sophisticated software stack. Otherwise, you Absolutely. cannot manage it. And that that is sort of the unlock for us in terms of the TAM. If mm. you look back into history, you know, the last... 10 years, or so, 10 years back, you didn't need something like QNX for your edge devices because the device wasn't sophisticated enough to mm. require all the things that QNX can do. Mm. But as they become smarter and as more and more of the computers being pushed to the edge, you know, the TAM is opening up for us. And a good example for us is the distinction between MPUs and MCUs, which mm. is obviously a big topic in, in the automotive segment. Right. Uh, you know, MPUs are rapidly rising. It's still a small portion of all the compute, but it's rapidly Everything. rising. And, you know, you look out 10 years and, and MPUs, at least value-wise, is going to be uh, you know, dominant yeah. uh, at the edge. So back to your question around the segments. Um, when we looked at this, actually, the team started looking at this way before I joined, but we, we had a strategy reset when I joined three years ago. And uh, what we said is, um, in terms of, the most advanced edge compute devices, the car is by far the most sophisticated. There, there's no comparison. Yeah. And it's almost getting ridiculous. I, yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, when you look at the modern architecture of the most advanced cars, I mean, the last one, I, and it, it's not a great uh, example because there are other, there are other things that matter uh, as much, but you, know, you used to talk about 100 million lines of code in a modern car. Yep. This summer, I heard one of the, I will not mention the name, but uh, one of the leading OEMs declaring that they now had 500 million lines. I mean, yeah. 500 <laughs> million lines of code. It, it's crazy. I, I mean, in any context, it's crazy, the complexity that you're dealing with. So back to the segment. So we, we decided uh, uh, way back that we believe automotive is the most sophisticated. If you sure. can serve the most sophisticated, and the trend is going in that direction, you will be able to later on leverage that for the others. So automotive is by far the most important mm -hmm. segment for us. Roughly 70% of our revenues from automotive. We see that continuing for, for quite some time. But there are other segments that are not far behind. Mm -hmm. and, and the obvious ones for us are, uh, you know, obviously everything that looks like a car. car. So commercial vehicles in general, Maybe. with or without yeah. uh, uh, plates. Uh, robotics mm. in general, 
Mm -hmm. uh, medical equipment mm -hmm. uh, at the edge, sophisticated medical equipment that requires the highest you know, safety and security and precision and so forth. Uh, and then, uh, a little bit surprising to me when I started digging into it, high-end industrial automation, uh, which sort mm -hmm. of ties to robotics, but it, it's a different type of robotics. No? So even you know, something as mundane as PLCs, you know, the high-end PLCs today, very, very sophisticated. Mm -hmm. So we see certain slivers of those segments, you know, uh, medical, commercial vehicles, industrial automation, starting to grow very, very fast. And it's mm -hmm. the si same trajectory. So it's from MCUs to MPUs, MPUs from right. single function to multifunction. And, and then the software stack grows and suddenly you're, you're sitting on this spaghetti code that you develop yourself <laughs> and you're saying, oh, I, I need to restructure the stack. Right. And that's where we, we then try to come in and help and say, well, we can take care of that for you and, and you can focus higher up in the stack. That's great. So how do you see for like next five years for BlackBerry in terms of your priority right now? So uh, in, in terms of the segments, I, I think for the next five years, we, we still, there's so much work left to do in automotive. automotive. I mean, we've, we've talked about the software defined vehicle for, for several years now, but if, if we're honest with ourselves, uh, you mm. know, this is a journey uh, and, you know, across all the 90 million cars or whatever it is that is being shipped yeah. every year, you know, you have the entire spectrum. You yeah. have some players uh, and certain models that are very, very sophisticated. Yeah. And then you have others that have hardly started the work. Yeah. And you have, you have this entire spectrum. And in my view, it's all going in, in, in that direction. It's all going towards, you know, more or less software-defined functionality and capability. So that's a 10-year you know, journey from my, my perspective, mm. uh, moving from those 100 plus ECUs to, you know, centralized compute Perfect. in various domains and so on and, uh, and all that stuff. So that's going to be very, very important. Um, I think long term, uh, you know, beyond five years, I think the opportunity for us in other industries is probably bigger than it mm. is in automotive, just because of the sheer volume sure. of devices and, right. uh, and, and the complexity of, uh, of those segments. So. That's, that's brilliant. So uh, I think that was fantastic inside our Blackberries vision, current portfolio and where you are going mm. uh, and I'm very happy to have this conversation with you again uh, but in a different context now. Sure. <laughs> so sure. thank you very much Great. for thank you. being part of this and thank you Appreciate very much it. again. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.